morning and welcome to week six of The King, the Snake and the Promise. As always, we'll do a brief recap on the previous weeks, just in case you missed any. So starting with Adam and Eve, we see that God uh, made heavens and earth and he made a beautiful garden. He made Adam and Eve to live in peace and happiness um, in the garden. God's people in God's place under God's rule. But they chose to listen to the snake and disobey God. And that could have been the end of the story, but we then heard that God, in his kindness and love, chose this man Abraham and made three promises. He promised to give Abraham descendants to whom he'd give a land and great blessing. And in particular, one particular descendant who would bless the whole world and deal with the problem of sin. And then we learnt about King David and we saw how these three promises were fulfilled in King David. So so God gave the land of Israel, and gave lots of descendants and blessings, and there's King David living in God's place under, under his rule. So everything's great, but then sadly it goes pear-shaped, and we learned how King Solomon uh, disobeyed God's rules, in particular the most important one, don't have any other gods, and he disobeyed his rule not to marry people from other lands who don't love or follow him. And here is King Solomon. And very sadly, King Solomon married 300 foreign princesses. And, oh, she's back to front. There she she is. 300 uh, foreign princesses who brought with them um, idols of wood, stone and gold. And here's Solomon with his idol. Instead of worshipping the true God, God the Father, uh, the creator of the universe, he was worshipping other idols with his wife. How very sad is that? And God promised to send them out of the land. He said, as a punishment, I will punish you, your descendants, and they'll be sent out of the land. And in a moment, we'll hear the next part of the story. But first of all, we're going to think about actions and consequences. So actions and consequences. Solomon uh, ignored God, ignored his commands, and the consequence would be that God would punish them. Now, thinking of other actions of consequences, suppose you are on the beach and you have an inflatable boat and you think, oh, I'd like to go in that boat. And you go out in the boat and maybe you go a bit far and it gets a bit rough and windy and the boat gets blown further and further out to sea. Well, you're in great danger, aren't you? And the only way, the only person who can come and help you is the lifeguard. And luckily, here he comes and rescues you and tows you back to the shore. That action had consequences. The action of uh, being careless with an inflatable boat meant that uh, you were in great danger and could even have died at sea. And another action and consequences, this is a book written by my brother-in-law, Stephen Venables, Philip's brother. There he is, a very younger version of Stephen. Stephen is a mountaineer. Um, professional mountaineer, and he was the first Briton to climb Mount Everest without oxygen, uh, and he went up, he found a new route. And this is a picture of uh, Stephen, um, I think near the end of his adventures. But his action, when he got near the top, I uh, wonder if I can find it, oh, there's there's. Yes, when he got up to the South Col, this is his route up the mountain. When he got up to the South Col, which is the last place that you can camp before the summit, uh, he, um, his colleagues 
were exhausted and they decided not to go any further. So Stephen was also exhausted, but he was determined to get to the top of Mount Everest. Everest. So he made the uh, slightly unwise decision to go on on his own. I've got to tell you that Mount Everest is 8,848 metres high. So that's almost nine kilometres high, an awfully long way up. And you can see from that other photo, um, see all his clothes he's wearing, how incredibly cold it is. Well, he got, he, although he's exhausted, he managed to plod on up to the summit. And, um, and when he was there, he was so exhausted that he couldn't get back to where his tent and his sleeping bag was. So he made the decision to spend the night on the mountain. It was extremely cold, and if it had been windy, he would certainly have died because it, he would have just frozen to death. But he was lucky, he just got frostbitten and managed to stagger back to camp eventually. But that's the consequences of his action. Look, there he is, as I say, all snowy. And uh, here's a photo of him. He got frostbitten. He got a frostbitten nose and his toes were frostbitten. In fact, they were so badly frozen that three of them didn't recover and he had to have them amputated. So action had, his actions had consequences and he, he lost his three toes and he was lucky to escape with his life. And then one other action and consequence story. Um, year six in the summer before they move on to uh, secondary school, have a week where they, I suppose it's an orientation week, and one day they go into Chorley and practice going to their new schools. So Mrs. Holmes gives them money for the bus fare, and they buy a ticket. This is even, is this even a bus ticket to Chorley, I think so, um, or ma perhaps back from Chorley. So they have the money, they buy the ticket, and then they spend a few hours in Chorley. Now, they can only get back home if they keep the ticket or have the money. Is, it a, is this a return, Moira? It is. It is. Right, so you need to keep your ticket and not lose it so that you can get back home again. And every year, there are one or two children who, um, who lose their ticket and have to walk all the way home. So their actions have consequences. If they lose their bus ticket, they don't uh, manage to get home. Well, they do get home, but it takes a lot longer and uh, they are a lot tired when they get home. So actions and consequences. And today we're going to think about sinning and the consequences of our sin and Solomon's sin and our sin. So I'll just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've given us uh, your word. Thank you that we have the stories of all those people in the, in the Bible who did sin against you and we see um, that you had to punish them because you have to punish sin. And thank you that we can uh, read about the consequences and we can learn from their mistakes and we can uh, ask for your help to love you more. So Father, we just pray that you will help me to speak and that you will help all the children to listen and learn more about you and your love and your holiness. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Great. So that was Actions and Consequences. Now, 400 years later, there's a new king called King Jehoiakim. Here is King Jehoiachin. So, King Jehoiachin was only 18 years old when he became King of Israel. As I said, it was 400 years after King Solomon had been the ruler of Israel. And there have been lots of other kings since then. Some were good, but most of them were not good. And th during that time, if not the kings, a lot of these people would worship statues of wood, stone, and gold. So a lot of disobedience. Um, Solomon, very sadly, had set a very bad example, and the other kings, and subsequently the people, followed that bad example. Now, perhaps it was an easy uh, mistake to make because 
The country is all his Israel, Jerusalem. The country is all around Israel, so Babylon and other countries, they worshipped other gods. Um, but just because other people were doing something wrong doesn't mean that it's right or that we have to join in. So perhaps if Julie at school was being really mean to Jane, do you join in? Or if your brother Robert was grumbling about your parents because he was having to do the washing up, do you join in? Why would you join in? Well, it's easier often to join in, to, to join in with people doing wrong. Why would you not join in? Because you know it's wrong and because you know it might upset or even harm people. And uh, it makes God sad too. So last week we saw how God said he was going to punish Solomon and his descendants for being disobedient. He, was told, he told Solomon that he was going to send his descendants out from their beautiful land, just like Adam and Eve had been sent out of the Garden of Eden. And that's exactly what he did. So it wasn't very long after Jehoiakim became king. In fact, it was only about three months after Jehoiachin became king. And here's the way it happened. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon. I don't need a bus ticket anymore. So here's King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And he sent his best soldiers marching towards Jerusalem. And he surrounded, here are all the horses, and his siege machine, and even a catapult, if I remember, I'll set the catapult off. And more soldiers to surround the city. He had thousands and thousands of soldiers. Here they are. I won't stand them all up because that will take quite a long time. So maybe some of them are asleep. There we are. All these soldiers surrounding, um, surrounding Jerusalem. And they surrounded the city so that no one could go in and no one could go out. Nebuchadnezzar wanted the land of Israel and he wanted the city of Jerusalem for himself. He wanted all the gold and the silver for himself. He wanted to become the most rich, the richest and most powerful king in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the area. He wanted to be the most powerful king around. And you know, there was a time when the people of Israel had been obedient to God and they had loved him and they had uh, heeded his commands and obeyed them, there had been a time when another king had surrounded Jerusalem and laid siege to it and brought his army. And they called out to God and prayed to him and called to him and asked for God's help. And God had heard their prayer and it made the army and the, and the armies that were attacking really frightened and they started attacking and killing each other and then they all ran away but not this time not this time because the people didn't call out to God for help and because God wanted to punish them so he was going to use King Nebuchadnezzar. Where's King Nebuchadnezzar gone? Oh, there he is. He was going to use King Nebuchadnezzar to bring about his will to punish the people. So it's a very sad story. All the people of Israel, all the people of Jerusalem were hungry. You see, they couldn't get out of the city. They couldn't get through the doors, through the gates, to go and collect food because the soldiers were guarding them. And they might have had a few animals to start with, but they'd quickly eaten those. 
and probably even the chickens because they didn't have any food to eat they'd have eaten them too so they were getting hungrier and hungrier and all the the enemy was surrounding them and they didn't have any choice well they had two choices either to starve to death or to surrender so in the end uh, King Jehoiachin surrendered to King Nebuchadnezzar and he, King Jehoiakim and his mother well, I expect they had to leave their crowns behind them and his mother and all the nobles were taken off to Babylon And all the wealthy people and all the leaders, and the children, were carried away to Babylon. And this was in the year 597 BC. That's about 600 years before Jesus was born. They were all carried away to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar took all the gold and all the silver. Where's the silver gone? Oh, there it is. All the silver and all the vessels from the temple, the gold vessels from the temper, temple. And he took them and he carried them away to Babylon. And he tied the prisoners up, and off they went. They had to march the long, long way to Babylon. And only a few people were left there. And Nebuchadnezzar, where's Nebuchadnezzar? There he is. Only a few people were left there, and Nebuchadnezzar made a relative relative of Jehoiachin, in fact he was his uncle, he made him king instead. But tragically, tragically, uh, King Zedekiah also rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. So only 11 years later, King Nebuchadnezzar returned and he burnt down the temple down the palace and he knocked he knocked down all the city walls completely trashed Jerusalem was completely crushed But meanwhile, all the people had been taken to Babylon. I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar put that somewhere safe. And the people built houses. People built houses there, but away from God's special land. away from God's special land that he'd promised to Abraham. God was punishing them for being disobedient, just like he said he would, and now everything was ruined. They weren't in God's land anymore, and they weren't blessed anymore, because they didn't want to live God's way. Well, that leaves us with a big question, doesn't it? Because God made a promise to his people. He promised to give them land. He promised to give them descendants. He promised to give them blessing. God told his family that he was going to bring, to, to use his family to bless the whole world, to put right everything that had gone wrong. And he called King David that David would always have one of his descendants to be a king, God's king, 
on God's throne. But it looks, looks as if just after everything had been fixed up, everyone uh, made it go wrong again. Everyone sinned and God had to punish his people. So the question is, what's God going to do about it? Do you think God will just forget his promise? Or do you think he might keep his promise in the end? Well, have a think about that question this week and we'll carry on with the story next week. But now we've got a, a song from The King, the Snake and the Promise. This is a song about Daniel. It's called In a Foreign Land. Now here's Daniel. Daniel was one of the exiles. He had been carried away to Babylon um, early on in the, in the first time that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had come. And he had carried... Uh, Daniel back with three of his friends, you probably know the stories of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, and Daniel had served under several kings in Babylon. And uh, at the time, uh, one you'll know one story, when Daniel uh, carries on worshipping God, even when King Darius says you should only worship King Darius. And you'll know the story about how King Darius um, uh, sent him into the lion's den. So this is the song in a foreign land and we'll listen to that now. sad, doesn't he? But where are the rest of the people? Well, of course, they've been taken off to Babylon. No, I've moved those. They've, they've gone. They've been taken off to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And notice that the crown is no longer crossed out. And that's because God is still in charge. Um, God has chosen to punish his people um, in, as a result of their sin. And he's punishing the people, so he is in charge, and the people are submitting to his punishment um, from King Nebuchadnezzar. So, very sad, called the exile, when God's people um, are sent out of uh, his country, his place. So, at the moment, God's people, uh, God's descendants, are not in his land, and they're not happy anymore. Okay, so um, that's the banner. Now application. Oh, 
just before I do that, I said I'd set the catapult off and I forgot to do it. So let's see if we can uh, set, set the catapult off and knock anything down. Oh, hmm. went a long way, but missed. But I'm sure they did have catapults in those times. So, um, we need to remember that God takes sin very seriously. That's why the people were punished. And I want to ask whether there have been any times this week where we have um, done things that we know that God would have been unhappy about, done things to grieve God and to upset other people. So God wants, um, wants us to know that we can always say sorry. He wants us to come to him and ask for forgiveness for all the wrong things uh, we do. So um, we're going to pray in a moment, but the point of the lesson today is that um, actions have consequences, our sin has consequences, our, our disobedience, God needs to punish disobedience unless, and this of course is what he wants, we go to him and ask for forgiveness. So uh, the lesson today is that we can always go to God, ask forgiveness, and he is quick to forgive us of our sins, give us from our sins. So today I just want to go through the Lord's Prayer. I want to think about the Lord's Prayer a bit in, in the light of the lesson, and then we'll pray it through when I've just got run through it. We'll pray it through together. Our Father in heaven, God is on the throne, in heaven so we pray that your will be done. God punished his people to help them to repent so that your will be done on earth. As it is in heaven, God is on the throne and his will will be done for our good and for his glory. Give us today our daily bread. God continued to look after his people in exile. They needed, and we need, to turn to God in repentance. Forgive us our sins. We'll pray this prayer together in a moment. And could you please ask God to show you whether there is anything in your life that you need to repent of and say sorry for? As we forgive those who sin against us, when we say sorry, God always forgives us. In the same way, we should always forgive others who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. Please help us not to join in with those who do things we know are wrong. But deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, let's, let's pray that together. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now we will conclude our lesson with the activities and the worksheets. So I'm going to um, just do a representation of the lesson with this egg, egg with this egg, get it right, with this egg box. So this is going to be the exile, a sad story. So we'll stick the label on the top of the egg box. There we are. But was it the end for God's people? Maybe we will do a little bit of glue down there too. There. And uh, this will be on, on the document if, if you want to print it off and do this activity. And inside... I've got two water balloons there, and I'm going to put sad faces on these water balloons because God has punished them and they have been sent out of the land. There's one water balloon and the other. And I thought if you, um, 
you probably won't have water balloons at home this time of year. And I thought instead of water balloons, you can always use eggshells. So again, just use half an eggshell. to make your sad faces, there we are. And then, so that's two water balloons, and then I've got um, a crown here to show that God is still on the throne. Oops. You can easily make that, make that out of some gold paper. And then I've got a house here, I'm going to make a house. This is just a stuff, bits of, um, these are from a ready meal. I stuck on a length of card, but again, you can just use a bit of cardboard. Um, and um, if you do it like that, you'll see it has two short, short walls and two longer walls. That's a house. And then somewhere I've had a flame to stick onto it, but it's gone. So we'll have our house not going up in flames. There we are, a house, and um, we can put these eggshells in here, can't we? So we've got lots of sad people, a house that should be going up in flames, but I've lost the flames. And then four very sad people because they've gone into exile and left God's special place, his special land. So there's our activity. And then if you'd like to do a worksheet, you can print off, your parents can print off. We've got one uh, word search and then a colouring sheet for any of the younger ones who would like it. So, what happens next? Will God keep his promise? Let's tune in. Let's tune in next Sunday and hear what happens next in our story of the king, the snake and the promise. Have a good week and see you next week. Goodbye.